Hello, hello. It's a beautiful Saturday. Or is it Saturday? I don't even know. I think it's Saturday. It's Saturday. In Winnipeg. And it is plus 12 Celsius, I think. Next to no wind. And we are in the absolutely stunning neighborhood of Crescentwood. That's a big grow. There's been a lot of renos to a lot of these houses, but even the ones that haven't, they're just so stunning. Crescentwood was originally called St. Boniface West back in the day. And then a real estate guy, land developer type fella, C.H. Enderton bought this whole chunk of land and named it Crest, Crescentwood. I always get confused because there's like Crestview, Crescentwood. Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful stretch. I think we're going up there on a different turn. This is Stafford. There's lots of cute little shops and bakeries, coffee shops, boutiques. Some have uh, been here for quite some time. There's been a little bit of change. This building on the corner is called Grosvenor Court. It was built in 1909. Oh, look at those side windows, the lower ones. 1909 and was and is a mix of residential and businesses like, uh, like the River and Osborne building. This is the same idea. So we'll cross over here. I'll turn around and get a better look at it when we're across. Yep. Yeah. Almost time. There's the Grove. That used to be Charlie O's canteen coffee shop. Feels windier than I thought, hey? Mm -hmm. Still warm though. So that's the one. That was 1909. That piece at the end looks a little crooked, hey? Grosvenor Court. Never noticed that little cleaner is there. <laughs> well, I guess that's like, maybe that's the back end of their house in the house. No, no, because that's a back lane there. But this is one of our favorite bakeries. Lilac Bakery. I don't think they're open. Maybe they are. They have great um, Imperial cookies. Another cute little shop. Some clothing and such. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Oof. Squeeze that building in, hey? It's now an office. This is the Winston. This was built in 1913. Those are pretty new windows, hey, now?
it seems like from what I read, a lot of this area was sort of 1908 to 1913 okay. for the builds. Wow. That looks like original, like what is that, cladding? Very cool, yeah. spring the bugs are out <laughs> this would be nice in the summer with all the greenery around it hey looks it like it almost looks like it's all new except for maybe the foundation Oh, they'd have like little bay window spots on that building. This is cute. Even like the basement apartments have full size windows. I like the shingles. Yeah, that's a super nice building. Right next to a metal home. It's interesting siding, hey? Mm -hmm. This thing keeps ticking, ticking up against it. Another all gray house. I guess both of these maybe are coming down for yeah, this. Looks like it. Maybe all three. Coming down to make way for that. It's interesting, they offer indoor bike storage and Peg City Co op car share. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's all three of these. They don't look particularly lived in. Now this building stumped me because I could not find anything about this building. But it looks old enough to have some history. Oh yeah. It was very weird. It's called the Ritz. But nothing, nothing showed up unless you want to rent there. I showed up. But maybe it's deceiving. Maybe it's not as old as it seems. But it certainly has the look of the older ones, hey? Mm We're gonna see some great front porches, I'm sure, in this area. We're gonna go all the way up to Wellington Crescent. We've been on Wellington, well, once down right by Cinnaboyne Park, once when we were doing the Academy Road video, and once, oh no, we were on River, and River becomes Wellington. So that was the connection there. These are neat. These are the Eugene apartments. I'll back up a little. These were built in 1914. Mm 
and they stretch along here. Obviously renovated at some point. Yeah, and this is lilac. We'll head down there a little farther on. Well, there you can kind of see them better. That's a big block. I love those little balcony sunroom. They're all enclosed. Nice. It's much windier than I thought. It's not cold, but hopefully it's not loud. That is an interesting doorway. I know, I like the doorway is neat too. Oh, not sure how old this one is. It's neat. This is brand new. Oh, there's a big boofer. Oh, <laughs> you got to the end of your rope there, buddy. Hey, it's okay. Reached the end of his chain mighty quick. Oh, this is for sale. A tri triplex plus owner suite. Oh my. That's kind of neat. Bet you that was something else in its day. This one's pretty nice. Pretty nice, yeah. Oh, it'll do. It's freaking gorgeous. Okay, and I think we can just turn left here on Wellington. If you went right, you pretty much will go into the heart of apartments slash condos on the river because Wellington backs onto the river, but we're going to cross over. Yeah. You think we should cross over or stay on this side? I don't know which would give us a better shot of the homes. Oh, there's a little, the one wheel board. Hey, what do you think? Stay on this side? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So the first house that I researched, really, uh, had a super interesting history. And I believe it is this one. Yep, 393 Wellington. So this house is called the Fortune House. And the original owner was Mark Fortune. He actually bought the property on Main Street that is now, or was called, is called, Fortune Block on Main Street in 1882. And this was his home. He was a businessman here in Winnipeg. And he was actually on the maiden voyage of the Titanic. And he died. His wife and three daughters lived, but he did not survive the downing of the Titanic. So that's kind of sad. Yeah, interesting. And after the war, this was turned into apartments and then it was renovated into three luxury apartments, one of which is available right now, it looks like. So yeah, I had no idea there was any like Titanic connection to Winnipeg. But stay tuned, there might be more. Ooh. It's a little hint. Don't go nowhere. Yep. This park across the way, it's called Munson Park. We'll poke in there uh, a little later. 
But that is actually where Pat and I got our wedding photos done. Decades ago now. Two and a half decades ago in there. And our photographer for the wedding uh, was actually a crime scene photographer. Yeah, so my dad is a policeman and he's like, oh, I know a guy. <laughs> so oh, yeah, we used that. his guy. He did pretty good. He did very good for the back in the day. So this one's lovely too. But I think this is the one. This has a very, look at that security system. That's a solid gate. And this is 412. You can see the top of it there. Oh, look at their front door. That's beautiful. Yeah. This was called Herb House. It was built in 1906. I'm gonna go on the other side of this little tree. And the architect was H.B. Rue. It's spelled R-U-G-H. So I don't think it's like a rough or anything. I'm pretty sure it's a Rue. But he designed a lot of the homes in this area and even ones that they're not 100% sure history-wise who the architect or designer was, they're pretty much crediting him because it was probably him. This one's lovely. Oof, private. I'm, I believe this is 424. It's called Hutchings House. It looks relatively abandoned, does it not? It does. Or just excessively uncared for. Yeah. I don't know, maybe they're like mid reno But they called this one, this was also H.B. Rue that designed it, Gifford Hall was what it came to be known as. It was owned by Alicia Hutchings, came to Manitoba in 1876. Oh yeah, it's 424. This is the one. Alicia Hutchings came to Manitoba in 1876, came upon some relatively hard times, was not doing so great, eventually took up a trade as a harness maker for Great West Saddlery Company, found success doing that, and went into his own manufacturing wholesale business, and that's where he made his coin. I think it's maybe under renovation because it looks like they're trying to do something with the porch, which is great because it's phenomenal. I don't know. Like the porch looks like it's sort of like a work in progress maybe. So maybe they are trying to do something. But it's not like being lived in. Maybe it's just a project, side project. Yeah, the top window looks like it's been changed. Yeah, maybe they're just doing it bit by bit. Oh, there's a little picnic in the park I can see. It's so nice, this temperature, like we are in light spring jackets now. We've not put away the winter jackets because we got a whee surprise this past week or so with a winter storm that rolled in. We went from plus 16 Celsius one day, woke up to minus 17 Celsius the next morning and snow that was essentially blowing sideways and then popped right back up to about plus 14. So anybody that suffers from any kind of pressure headaches, this was not the week for you, myself included. So we're now looking for 484 Wellington, which I think is up here with the gate. And here's a shot of the adorable park. I feel like we were the only ones in there on our wedding day, which was nice. It is lovely. I don't think we've even been back since our wedding day. We should go back, recreate our corny pictures. Oh my, I think this is the one I was looking for. That's like a full three-story gargantuana. 
Do you think that's their garage, that burgundy thing in the back? I would imagine it looks like it's on their property. Yeah. Oh, I don't even think this is it. This is 480. Wow. They have like, oh, there's somebody there. I wonder what that, uh, the initials are. So not, oh, they have a horse and carriage. Look at this deer. That would have looked pretty neat lit up, hey? These trees are fantastic. So Munson Park was actually previously the Munson Farm house site. So in here, there was actually a home. And the home was built in 1889 to a railway lawyer, J.H. Munson. So that is why the park is called Munson Park. Now going back to what I first said about um, the dude, and his name escapes me now, who bought the land for Crescentwood. J.H. Munson, he had his farmhouse on this land and he named his farmhouse Crescent, oh my God, Crescent View. Crest, Crest View, Crescent View, I've lost it. Anywho, uh, the guy who bought all this land liked that name so much, he asked Munson, can I name the whole area that? And he's like, yeah, sure. So now he, he just chose the guy's house name. And later on, the Richardson family um, lived in this property as well. And then the house was demolished. And now it's just a big park. They own the whole park property? Like well, that? they did. That was their farm site wow. or the farm house. So I don't know where their farm land was. Maybe it was part of it. Jeez. Yeah. Crest View, Crescent Wood, Crescent Wood. Because Crest View, that's over in like Westwood area. Yeah. We've lost the plot. Let's see if this is 480. I think something got demolished. Maybe it's the house that I wanted to show you. I bet ya. No way. Yep. Well, prior to current, this house was built in 1912. It was built by Donald Ross, subdivided for a time in the 40s and was later purchased by George Richardson. So the Richardsons had a lot of property around here. But now you'll never know, because it's gone. Gosh, you gotta wonder, what did they pay just to demolish it, hey? Kind of crazy. Oh, there. Look, there's their gate. That's a big piece of land, hey? They would have had for their yard. Oh, well. Maybe not. This says 514. What number were you looking for? 484, but that last house was 480. Oh. Maybe there's two pieces of property here. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, this one's gone and it's sad. So we are coming up on what is now called 529. It is a steakhouse, high-end steakhouse, very delicious. Generally fantastic service, very knowledgeable wait staff. And the interior is breathtaking. So if you want to see inside one of these old mansions, 
go have a steak or some dinner or some lunch, more affordable, uh, at 529, and you'll get a glimpse inside what these houses looked like because so much of the wood and the character is still very well taken care of in there. So it was built in 1912 and designed by architect John Russell, who's done a few, like I've said his name a few times in our videos. Um, and he built it for James Ashdown. And Ashdown is the one that has the Ashdown warehouse condos downtown and had like his hardware type business. I think he started out as a tinsmith and he was actually a millionaire by 1910. So in 1910, can you imagine yeah, that's, what uh, a million would feel like? And the guy who designed this also designed the Westminster Church, which we haven't gone by yet, but will. And the Augustine Church, which I believe was the one in Osborne Village that we walked by on River. Mm. And this was sold in 1952 to the Shriners to hold their meetings. And then somewhere around 2003, I think, Wow Hospitality bought it to host or to use as a restaurant. And they've got like the little garden in the back. Yeah, this is where my brother-in-law got married. It's beautiful back there. And they had like, I think maybe we'll see it on the other side. Yeah, I guess this is where we could cross the road. We'll go into the parking lot. They have like, I think like, um, almost like a servant's quarter slash garage type in the back. more cars. Should we just run? So I know the basement and the third floor um, are like offices for the WOW Hospitality group. And then the first floor, they have a beautiful bar lounge on the left hand side and dining space on the right and the second floor because these old houses it's certainly not open concept like they are now we're just a bunch of different rooms of varying sizes so they've made them into dining rooms like just miscellaneous dining rooms we ate in one that had maybe two other tables in there with us for one dinner i was here for a work dinner and we were the only table in the room this depends what group size you have Yeah. Oh yeah, they've started prepping dinner, I guess. So the building here with the little door, I believe is not attached. Yeah, this was like the, I guess like the chauffeur maybe? where he would stay or work out of. Yeah. Oh, you probably can't see it, but back here is where the wedding was hosted. No, and then that's the river beyond there. This here, that's St. Mary's. This is Shari Zedek Synagogue. It's the oldest synagogue in Winnipeg. Formed, the congregation was formed in 1880 and the congregation's first building was constructed in 1890. And that one was located on King Street at Henry, I believe. And this location has been here since uh, 1950. And way back when, this piece of property had two 
large homes on it owned by some prominent businessmen. I don't know if you can see if this is the window, but there is a window, a large window. Maybe it's not here anymore. Um, oh, those all have it. It was stained glass that was made by Leo Mall, oh. whose sculptures we saw downtown. And he has an entire sculpture garden at Assiniboine Park. Can you see the glass yeah, it indicated that it was like a large window. So maybe that's no longer on the building and it's the small ones. But yeah, the largest first synagogue. And Sherry Zedek, oldest, yeah. Uh, means gates of righteousness, which I think sounds nice. Oh, 550 Wellington is the uh, St. Mary's Academy. And this is, I think this was one of the first buildings in the area because this came here. 1903. Should we cross back maybe? Sure. While well, there's no traffic. <laughs> so this is a private Catholic school. So I doubt we can get in, but We might take a closer look in the summer when this is all green, because you wouldn't even be able to see that in the summer. See. So in 1869, two gray nuns, and the gray nuns had their home over on Tache, if you mm -hmm. recall, yep. from the St. Boniface video. Um, they opened the first Catholic school in Winnipeg in 1869. So it was located in a rented house between the Forks and Portage in Maine. So I assume on the northeast side of Maine there, somewhere along there. And the enrollment increased so rapidly over the next 10 years that they opened a new site on Notre Dame in 1881. And the demand kept growing. So they moved it to this site 15 acres in 1903. Yeah. I would imagine the inside, I mean, we have lots of relatives that went there, like cousins. And I'm pretty sure I played, I went to a Catholic school, private school when I was younger. And I know for a fact we played St. Mary's in basketball. So I've been in there like a time or two and I think we even like, got invited to each other's dances and stuff. So I'm sure I went to a dance there. It's an all girls school in 1915, I think, or 1905 to 1915, or maybe the late 1800s, they allowed boys. And I think that stopped in 1915. Although I kind of recall maybe that I read that it was 1950 but only in like the younger grades. And it's currently, I think, an all girls school again. I believe St. Paul's is like the brother sister school to them. They're over on Grant Avenue. Now we're gonna go down Kingsway, which has way more history than I realized. I think we've got time. If we need to bring this to an hour and a half, we're... Yeah. Good. Nothing's even blinking on the gimbal yet. These houses are going to be something else. And you just always wonder, like, what do they cost to heat? How energy efficient are oh they? Goodness. Like, holy cow. Well, that's the thing. They wouldn't be very energy efficient, but they're huge. So yeah. probably be a fortune to heat. Yeah. Oh, I think this first one here. Whoo! Three hundred and 
three floors on this beauty. They've even got one of those overhangs at the front door that looks like a hotel. We gotta like keep an eye out for like the house numbers. Yeah, this is 12. So this was built in 1911. It's considered English Georgian. It has its own ballroom. So I don't know what you do with something like that now. I guess maybe that's like your games room or whatever. It was built for the Western Regional Manager from Bank of Commerce, Veer Brown. And in 1970, it was renoed because the president of the University of Manitoba lived here. The large window over the entrance, you can kind of see it there. It was once a giant piece of stained glass art. I can still see the stained glass through there. It's just you can't see it through the reflection. Oh. I can see it. They preserved it somehow with more efficient glass. Some of these windows are literally still wood though. They have a greenhouse here on the... This is uh, like a sunroom, I guess? Maybe. Oh, oh my, look at all the plants in there. So pretty. Where's 47? Was it that little, that's 37. 43, oh, 47's here. Oh, this one's interesting. So this brown one that looks uh, kind of like Tudor style. Green door backs onto the St. Mary's Academy property. This brown one here, 47, was built in 1906. And the original owner was murdered by the man that he suspected of stealing his property out at his cottage in Winnipeg Beach. <laughs> really? Yeah, so I guess he uh, confronted the guy that he thought stole his stuff from his cottage and the guy killed him. Oh, well, that's sad. So he actually only lived here for like a couple years. That is sad. Wow. It's a bummer. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny, but it's... No, I know, yeah. it's Some of the stuff I was reading, I'm like, oh my. Short lives for a bunch of these folks. And this one, number 53. Do you want to go on that side of the road? I mean, there's houses on both sides, but... This one was uh, built in 1908. Gosh, look at that little front entrance. Little, oh my God. Perspective, please. These trees. Guess how much this one cost to build? Ooh, in 1908? Mm hmm. Uh, 20 grand. Seven. 7,000? And they put down a what deposit of $10. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of cool is up until the 1990s, the people living here were all members of the original family. So like it went through generations oh, and stayed with the family, right. which is sense. pretty awesome. Where's 66? It's this one. This one could maybe use a little love coat of paint. So 66 was built in 1907 for nine grand. So it costs more than the one we just saw. Mm -hmm. The architect was W. Blair. He built this for his daughter when she married the son of William White of Canadian Pacific Railway fame. Mm. And the same guy also designed Roslyn Court. And what's interesting now looking at it is those are the exact same colors used on the Roslyn Court building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Which I didn't even realize. And we need 68, which I think is this white one. I'm just gonna poke over to these ones though, while here, cause they're beautiful. Look at the porch on that one. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So number 68, 
I think it's been credited with like having been very well maintained over the years. It was built in, hi. Oh, we film walking videos of Winnipeg. Oh, wonderful. And I noticed this had a lot of history when I was looking online. So we're reading out the history of the houses that we know about. Super. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Oh, I talked about your house. Wow. You're on the list. Did you know that your house originally was bought for $7,000? No. That's crazy. <laughs> I, I'm not going to ask you what you paid for it. The family's still there. That's the other thing we read. And it's, I read that they left around the 90s. Or is there still family members living there? Yep, still family. Wow, oh, that's okay. awesome. Well, nobody, nobody moves out and, <laughs> and pass it on. Keep passing it on. Well, it's beautiful. Well, thanks for doing yeah. this. We're very active in uh, making this heritage conservation district. Oh, that's excellent. Right. Right. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Well, people seem to like. I mean, I don't have a huge audience, but they seem to like when we tell them about, we've done some in the exchange, we've done River and Roslyn, and this is just, it's too beautiful not to come and show it off. Yeah, so. like Yale and Harvard are spectacular. They're coming up, yep. Yeah. I know, they're stunning. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No problem. Thanks for stopping. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Phew, I thought we were gonna get in trouble. So 68 was built in 1921, built for a man named Charles Lee, who was the general manager of the North American Lumber and Supply. And yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the one that they gave kudos for how well it's been maintained. Like, it does um, look well maintained. Maintained to sort of its original image you know what i mean like they mm -hmm. didn't try and change anything oh right okay oh this is 73. so 73 was owned built in 1906 owned by jj borbank he was a real estate developer guess how he died oh murder no he also went down with the titanic really yep oh, so that's no. two two so far yeah uh, and cool. the street in River Heights, Borbank, is named after him. I wonder if him and the other guy knew each other. Chances are. They get close to each other. Yeah. More to come on the Titanic. Wow. 83. Look at this one. Holy moly. Jeez. This was built in 1908 for 8500 bucks. Steel. So, like... Cheaper than my car in 2007, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So this is a classic revival style. And they say the elaborate wooden door and side lights came from the Royal Alexandra Hotel, which wow. is no longer in existence. It was demolished in 1971. Yep. But look at that entrance. Beautiful. Holy moly. Like the molding around it came from there, too? I or the guess lights, just so. the lights in the door? You know, the, the, the side lights are the two pieces on either side of the door. Right. Maybe the whole door frame piece, I'm not sure. Hmm. But it's beautiful. So in the 1930s, this was the home of Charles D. Roblin, wow. son of the former premier Rodman Roblin, and father to the former premier Duff Roblin. So Duff Roblin's dad lived okay. here. So I know a Roblin family who is related to all this. They live just across the river from here. Charles. Charles. And so this, I guess, would be, so if Duff was his uncle, the Charles that owned this house would be his great uncle, I think. Yeah, something something like that. I tried to do the math on that, and I think that's what I came up with. Oh, look at that. Boy, they're just so pretty. This looks like it was maybe a Renault. I wonder what was there before. 91, built in 1905. It still holds its architecture oh, pretty. On, like, look at the wood and the roof yep. ceiling of the front porch. Yep. 
in the 40s that was inhabited by an archbishop. Yeah. This kind of feels like the buildings downtown where I'm like, oh, if the people working these buildings know how beautiful they are, it's like, if you live in this area and you just walk your dog around and it's just the neighborhood, are you like as impressed with it all the time as I would be? 98 was built in 1911 called the Cotter House. Designed in the Queen Anne style. I love it. And from what I'm gathering, Queen Anne style, like everything looks like it's evenly placed, but yet still not symmetrical. You know what I mean? Right. Because that's the same style. Have, like uh, a turret looking thing. Yeah. Same style as like the Roslyn Court. Court. Right. Because that I was like Queen that. Anne as well. And it was interesting because when we did our river tour or river avenue tour um in the live chat somebody had asked like oh i wonder what it costs to live there now and funnily enough on marketplace somebody was renting and it was 1200 bucks a month for a two bedroom and it had like a full dining room which i don't think you find those in apartments anymore This one's nice. I imagine it probably looked fairly similar, although like you could kind of tell siding's been replaced, mm -hmm. door's been replaced maybe. Although the framing around the door looks the same. And the trim above that, the windows on the main floor, mm -hmm. that's lovely. Yeah. It is amazing considering the age of some of these oh. houses that, and the condition that they're in, it's amazing. They're still up and straight and yep. they look great. Yeah, there are some neighborhoods we've been through with the really older homes and they like literally look a little sideways. Mm -hmm. Maybe the earth here was just a little firmer. Kept everything upright. That's Kelvin High School. So we're back on um, the Stafford. So we kind of started right around Stafford and Grosvenor. gonna head up Harvard the gentleman I doubt anyone heard anything that the gentleman who stopped us said but he is part of the group that works to maintain heritage status or gain heritage status for a lot of the older buildings in the area they were the group that fought to not have that home on Wellington torn down sorry that bus was very loud so he was just like I don't know, maybe he was concerned that we're scoping it out for the next thing to take down. I'm not sure, but he was very pleased to hear. I'm sorry, I just gotta go check this thing out. That we were in no way aiming to take anything down. What no, is he this? He's very appreciative that we're giving your yeah. history. Is this like someone's garage? This is like back where the garages are. I had to come and peek. Oh no, that's the house. Oh my gosh, I wanna see that from the front. That is interesting. Sorry, just a little detour. So yeah, he was very appreciative um, that we were telling the stories of the homes because he wants more people to know and realize that they're worth saving, basically. And he's absolutely right, I think. Oh gosh. Especially when they rebuild with something sort of out of the neighborhood style. Absolutely. I it's understand kinda, renewal, eh. but it, I, yeah. I prefer preserving yeah. renewal. You know what I mean? And if you are going to renew, renew, renew. Uh, maybe pick a style that jives with the street vibe, you know? Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, everybody has their own personal taste. We've talked about that in a number of house videos. But yeah, it's tough. Okay, 
we'll go up Harvard. Harvard and Yale, he said, were two of the nicest, which I agree. Um, and you can go behind us like blocks and they're just stunning. Oh, I wonder if I'm the right way around. No, oh, I'm the right way around. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Lovely. I think this is the one. Yeah. This is 67. This is the one. Cute. The house is set so far back. That is weird. Must be old. I guess back yeah. in the day this was like a country property or something. Yeah, and you would have gone up there with um like your cart. Horse cart. The size of that elm tree in the yard is impressive. Yeah, this will be stunning to walk through in the summer. Just, but like I said in the last video, it's easier to show you stuff in the spring because you can actually see everything. So this is 61. So. This one was built in 1913. There are no like original owner details, but uh, in the 50s and 60s, this was home to Jack O. Blick, founder of the radio station CJOB. So this is where he lived. And we wondered, we figured the J-O-B of CJOB was for Jack O. Blick, but what is a C for? Communication? Canadian is Canadian? communication something. Nah. So this is Brent's boss. <laughs> In a roundabout way, yeah. Yep. Look at the brick on this one. They painted it, but you could still tell it's likely very original. Oh, look at that front door with a little gate in front oh, of it. I love it. So this number 53 was built in 1907. It was owned by Lieutenant Colonel William Grassy, a real estate investor who Grassy Boulevard is named after. Ah, transporter. And then in the 1930s, it was owned by Harold Drury, of Drury's Brewery, which existed at Maine and Redwood. And I gotta say, somebody's gotta bring the name of that brewery back. Because like Drury's Brewery, just, I just love it. It's ridiculous. But so I love we it. got Bubba's Boss, <laughs> and, Bubba's and, Drury's boss brewery. and Drury's Brewery. Side by side. Yep. <laughs> Where is 60? Oh, this is 60. Ooh, look at this lake. We won't cross there. This was built in 1924. So I guess for the area, this is relatively new. Uh, in the 1930s, it was the residence of John Crowley from Jacob Crowley's manufacturing company. That sounds all very British. It does. <laughs> I don't know if it is or not. I feel like we'll be seeing this house soon, but take a look at the back. Forty-seven. This was built in 1909, owned by John Perrin, who was the president of the San Antonio Gold Mines. And his son at one time owned the Hotel Fort Gary. Look his at those, did, yeah. So did his son live here, I wonder? Uh, at some point, maybe when he was younger. Look at the cement around the top window there. Yeah. It's interesting. The wind's not too noisy. Look at the stonework around the porch on this one. <coughs> 27. Oh, this is another interesting one. So this was also designed by H.B. Rue. So he's the guy I mentioned before who's done a lot around here. It's called Suckling House. And the original owner, John Suckling, was in London with his wife in April of 1912. They were on vacation. The Fortune family, who lived over in that beautiful home on Wellington in the very beginning of the video, they were also in London at the same time. They were in the same hotel and they had planned to return, as we know, on the Titanic, which did not fare too well for Mr. Fortune. 
Um, so Mrs. Suckling tried to convince her husband, John, to change their home return plans and book them on the maiden voyage of the Titanic because she thought, how cool would that be? Um, but John Suckling refused. He was steadfast. He's like, no, we're going home the way we planned to go home. And as we know, fortune died. The Suckling family didn't because they did not go on the boat. And John Suckling never let his family forget how his stubbornness essentially saved their lives. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's three man. Titanic connections. See, and you give me. <laughs> Oh well, yeah, lives yeah, maybe one day. I assume this is 27, because yeah, it's all brick. So this was built in 1907. It was built by William Alsip of Alsip Brick Tile and Lumber. And is Alsip's not around anymore? I believe it is. Yeah, it yeah? still is. They're underneath the bridge on. Uh, yeah, Tash. it's still tile and cement work, yeah, right? It's still there. So this was his home, the original dude. Mm. Yeah. Regent Bridge? Is that what that bridge is called? Where, where um, there? Nairn. Archibald and Nairn, that's it. The Nairn Bridge. The Nairn Overpass. That's it. This, obviously, something got taken down and built here. See, that's not really preserving that Yeah, I know. This number 11. was built in 1906 another one by H.B. Rue and it's in the Dutch style which you can tell by the roof line we always call those like oh it's like a barn house but mm -hmm. it's actually Dutch architecture and like I said H.B. Rue is the guy that if they're not sure who built it they pretty much credit him because it was probably him and he was committed to providing well-designed picturesque houses for middle-class families so they weren't all like Massively massive mansions. Well, this one is Although, still like, pretty they're present. still lovely. This is what's called Peanut Park. We'll walk through there in a little bit to get back to a different point. But now we're gonna go and take a boo at the houses on Ruskin. Now, I think I have to go a little backtracky. See, this blue one would be Dutch architecture as well. Mm -hmm. Things you learn yeah. when you go for a walk. I think the first one is this absolute stunner on the corner. Different stunner, different corner than the one we just took a look at. Like, look at these guys. Ooh, hear the birds chirp. I believe this should be 29. Let's see if there's a number on the front. Yep, 29. We'll try and get in the, in the opening. Oh my, like almost all of them are still the wood windows. Mm -hmm. And it still looks great. Yeah, well those ones are a little crooked. This was built in 1914. It's considered an Elizabethan manor, so not Tudor, I guess. Or maybe that's part of what that is, I'm not sure. Oh, look at the chimney. It was owned by Robert Scott. And that was a Winnipeg man who made his fortune in the fruit biz. I think this will be number 25. 
So you can kind of tell this was designed by A.E. Cubbage, who also designed homes for families like the Eatons over on Wellington Crescent. The design is called Italianate, and it has the details like the lower pitched roof. It's not quite as high peaked. The rounded window tops, which it looks like a bunch have been replaced. And the front there. I can see one. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of the stuff that we were like, oh, it looks kind of Spanish. Well, actually, mm -hmm. like we would have looked at this and been like, oh, it's got, it got kind of a Spanish feel. Right. But it's considered Italian. Look at their front lights. Right. Are those like gargoyles over their lights? Looks like they're um, the dining room walls in here. So they didn't use wallpaper, but they were hand painted very intricately hand painted to replicate the pattern on a Florentine fabric. Mm -hmm. Oh, we might have missed number 20 there. That one there, that Tudor one, was built in 1905, and that is a basic Tudor. Oh, and this guy? So the original owner of this house, his name was Frederick Stevens, and he made his fortune in diamonds in Africa. So I don't Whoa. know if that's like part of the whole blood diamond thing, if that was going on back then, like the movie. Mm -hmm. Was he um, a local? That. I'm not sure if he was like born here or came here after he made his fortune. I'm not sure. Wow. But yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, this one was 1908. And it was Dutch colonial style. We were right. You were right. Look how good we're getting. And this was built as a wedding gift for a woman named Miss Amy Elliott from her father. When did they stop uh, giving the kids houses for wedding gifts? <laughs> right. Because <laughs> we didn't get one. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Number 14, look at all the stonework on that one. Although some of it looks redone maybe, I'm not sure. This was built in 1909. The daughter of local wholesaler RJ Whitla lived here and her name was JC Armitage. And her husband was a well-known oarsman and he was the first Winnipeg crew to row in the Henley Regatta in 1897, which I assume is a major rowing race. Mm. Um, after he had won the championship of America in the early 1890s. Wow, he got paid really well for winning that yeah. championship. Well, no, her dad bought it, not him. Again. He just, uh, he just got to participate in enjoying it. Wow. But I think there's a story of another rower. So we had like, Along with like great business minds in Manitoba, we had a lot of great athletes. Still do. We can probably cross over. Yeah, because this is lumpy bumpy. What time is it? An hour. This one, oh, design shop. Residential. Oh, so they've had their home interior designed recently. 1910, the original owner was lawyer A.C. Ewart. And it was occupied a few years later by Ethelbert Neeland, the president of his own grain company and the manufacturer of the British elevator, manager of the British elevator company. They're getting some renos done. You see some paint. They got a nice yard. Amusement. Kitty's at the park. Kind of cute. Do, do, do. Oh, they have a Leo Mall sculpture, I think. Oh, is that the Blueberry Lady sculpture? I think so.
So this brown one here, number 10, has an interesting backstory. In 1912, they say, it was a beautiful home and it was actually mourned when it was demolished. It was called the Davidson House and an art gallery even like held a tour of the home before the demolition in 1963. It had like 37 rooms, a ballroom, it had an elevator, it had a turnstile in the garage so you could just spin your car around. And then in 1974, they built this. So yeah, it was, uh, I actually looked up a picture of the original home. It was grand. There was something there. It was pretty stunning. But from 1963. Hi, how are oh, we're you? doing a little video tour of the area, giving the history, history of the homes. Oh, yeah. So this was built in 1974. Just okay, so you know. Okay. Where, <laughs> my uncle used to live, was your neighbor at one time, Joseph Gabriel. I don't know if you were living here at the time. You know, I just moved inside the door. Oh, I think they were gone. The neighbors, these are the only neighbors. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, take care. So, yeah, you, you too. Thank you. Well. you. Have a great day. So it's funny when we were doing the history research for the street, we're waiting and waiting to see number eight because Pat's aunt and uncle lived here. And it's like the only one that they didn't note any history for. But this was the home of his aunt and uncle. And his uncle was a businessman in Winnipeg for many, many, many years. He had a theater. And what was the cave? Like just a restaurant? I don't know what it was initially, but he uh, was a pizza place at yeah. one time. It was all and then they food. have their hair salon. And then they, they moved to a newer area in Tuxedo once they sold this one. Number six here. Oh, look at their front landing. That's nice. Sorry if that got a little pixelated. This was built in 1910. Chester Stovall built it after a design he saw by Victor Horwood, who I'm pretty sure Victor Horwood designed the Moxley House apartments on River Road or River Avenue. And it's like full of like walnut paneling and stained glass windows. It's probably very lovely. thought that guy was gonna be mad at us. <laughs> he was initially. Yeah. <laughs> we should have like a t-shirt. We're just doing a history tour. And this little one here, this was originally built in the 1920s. Well, not this one. The original home was demolished. Uh, used as a frat house in the 50s. So I think this came to be in like 1957. Okay. But the original owner in the 20s version of the home uh, was Dr. John Davidson, a scientist known for work in cancer research. This one's beautiful. Oh, it's for sale if anybody has a couple mil to spare. Do you got a couple mil to spare? Is that what it, how do you know it's a couple mil? <laughs> because I think I saw it online. Yep. Oh, you do? No. Was that a yep? That's a no. To having a couple million oh, in the bank? No. Number two, Ruskin Row, was built in 1912. Look at that, gosh. It's in great shape. Yeah. I wonder if it's had any work done. Well, the shingles, obviously. Uh, the original owner was Frank Druxerman, who managed the Savoy Hotel. Okay. Where was that? The Savoy Hotel? Yeah, sounds uh, familiar. Yeah, it does. It was, I don't know. Thanks. Um, in the 1940s, it was sold to Winnipeg sororities who used it to host their meetings. Wasn't the Savoy Hotel downtown? Probably. Wasn't that what, um, oh, that climbing wall place on Higgins and Maine? Oh, the Youth for Christ? Yeah, or, it, wasn't I think that's what it that there? is. Um, or close or something, I can't remember. I can almost see like the up and down sign on the side of the building. You know that, oh, look at that stained glass on the side. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Look at, Look at those chimney. chimneys, holy. 
So we're gonna cut through the park and come back along Avonhurst. Cause there's some stunners over there. I think going this way, the wind is all but gone, hey? Mm -hmm. We need to just get to over to that corner. Don't want to put any kitties on the video. Oh yeah, they're getting a huge reno in the back in their garage. Mm -hmm. Look at that greenhouse sunroom type thing. I used to bring, so we talked about the Roblin family on Harvard, I think it was. And uh, I nannied for the Roblin family that lived across the river, and I would bring the little boy to this park. He's you just not had to... a little boy anymore. He is not. He is a grown man, and he is a local musician in Winnipeg. So go check out Flamenco Sketch on Instagram. He's a cool, cool kid. I love the music too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Little Georgie boy. God, that was a long time ago. It was. Oh, someone's having a birthday. And she got a vacuum and she's excited. I would be too. I know that sounds ridiculous. I think this is 34. Yeah, this is 34. This is the house that we saw from the side walking up Harvard. This was built in 1909. It was one of several homes in the area owned by members of the Stovall family, which we talked about on the other side there, who owned Stovall Company Limited, which was a printing business. And apparently in the back, there's a huge stained glass window. I don't know if it's there anymore. We didn't see it. We just saw the, the buildings. Uh -huh. It's beautiful. 1909. trees are awesome. This is 26. This was built in 1905. It was owned by R.C. McDonald of C.H. Enderton and Company. Ah, that's the guy's name. Enderton is the one that bought all this land and created the neighborhood essentially. Oh really? Yes. So I remember reading that like the guy picked out this lot to build this house in 1905. McDonald did. Um, members of the company, the C.H. Enderton and Company real estate firm, I guess, were allowed to just pick out choice lots for their own homes. And when I first read that, I was like, well, why did they get to pick out lots? Well, now it makes sense because their boss was the guy who bought all the land. So they got this lovely spot facing Peanut Park. This is cute. It doesn't look quite as old. I think there's a house that maybe got torn down. In here somewhere? Maybe, because um, there should be a number 10. And that's number 20, and this house on the corner looks like the modernist one that was built in 1974. It looks like it would have been right here. Probably. Yeah. So the house that was here was built in 1905, designed again by H.B. Rue. It was owned by Clarence Shepard, and his son married one of William White's, from C.P. Rail, daughter. Zuh. But, alas, now it seems to be somebody's side yard, maybe. Interesting. 
and our final street is Yale and I cannot get enough of these houses. I feel like we want to go and peek at that gray one. I see the numbers. That one I think said 60. No, I don't think I have anything for this one. It's gone under some renos, it's beautiful. gables there and stuff. Mm -hmm. Double chimneys again. The multiple chimneys on these old homes definitely show off that many, many rooms had fireplaces, hey? So I'm going to assume then that this is 54 Yale. It was built in 1908. Built for W.H. Cross, a real estate agent. It was built in Georgian style which they basically said means it was very symmetrical, which minus the little side piece, it absolutely was. Hey? Yep. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. The brick is in fantastic shape. It's amazing, no cracks. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't have a good enough eye to know if anything's been redone in that brick laying way. Oh, yeah. She's trying to poke out. This is number 60. It was built in 1905, Queen Anne style. They say you can tell by irregular shingle pattern. Uh, looks like the shingles are all laid the same to me. Maybe back in the day. That's a modern shingle. Yeah, but... From what I could tell, the Queen Anne style is that everything looks even, but it's not symmetrical. There's some original stained glass or lead glass windows. Hey. Mm -hmm. Look at this one. Oh, this is cool. So this one was originally built in 1906. It was a home when it was first built. Um, in the 1930s though, it became a small private school called Wellington House School. Yeah. And area families like the Ashdowns and the Drurys, they sent their kids to this school. I thought that was pretty cool. Oof, look at that one. Oh my. So this has clearly been painted because I would doubt it would have all been black. But it was built in 1908. So the early resident here was Moray Sinclair who was active in the Winnipeg Little Theatre. And I think this is also the home where two of the very early teachers for Grant Park High School. Like, I don't know when that officially opened. Mm -hmm. Not currently the state it is in now, but what was. Right. Two of the very first teachers lived here. I like the front entrance though. Mm -hmm. It's nice tucked in there. So we want number 85 next. I'm hoping it's this one, cause that's a beauty. Yeah, that's 85. Look at that. Beautiful. That was built in 1909 for Edwin Ryan of Ryan Agency Insurance. When I like see these business names and stuff, like all sips, obviously is familiar. Ashdown's familiar. But like 1909, Ryan Agency Insurance. Is that like, did that morph into that? Isn't there like a Ryan Garriock Insurance? Like, could the Ryan of those two last names be this family that 
It's possible. Started it. Like I think a lot about that kind of stuff. Anyway, once he was done with the house, it was owned by Harry Ashdown, who is the son of J.H. Ashdown. And Harry actually took over his father's company. And apparently there's a stable in the back. Wow. Yeah. For them horses. Ooh. It's amazing how a lot of these names are still relevant today. Well, and right? how, how many, many of them are so tied together. Right. Even from like the tuxedo families, the River Avenue Roslyn Road families. Mm -hmm. Is this, oh yeah, 97. This one was built in 1909. It was built for Crawford Richards, owner of a merchandising firm. And his son was also a rowing champ. Not sure if his son was the rowing champ that married the gal who's got the house over on yeah, Ruskin, I like wonder. could be. But if not, then we had two pretty awesome rowing champs. I'm trying to see if I can see the stable. Oh man, is that actually the stable? That green and white building in the back? Oh geez, yeah, probably. Hmm. So now it's their garage. So I'll guarantee that probably close to just about every city has neighborhoods like this where you can go and look up online and see who started these neighborhoods. How did they come to be? Who lived here? Like the guy that made his fortune in fruit and the guy that made his fortune in diamonds lived across from each other. I guess right. it's also random. Three people associated with the Titanic within three streets of each other. Like just crazy so if you like this video you like hearing about winnipeg and such please hit the like button uh, oh i also want to give a huge shout out to cynthia my subscriber who's living in california for her generous generous paypal donation that was lovely um, and very much appreciated and yeah like the vids subscribe if you haven't yet i'm going to show you very old something very modern right next door that's essentially winnipeg in a nutshell so have a great weekend everyone bye guys